space was suggested to be part of Europe. This, um, this mobility of the continents, the uh, colliding and the separating and the coming and going of oceans was once heresy, but now it's very much accepted as geological law, so to speak. The evidence for this theory of plate tectonics, as we call it, which is the basis for the mobility of the continents and the coming and going of the oceans, came from very many different areas, um, from paleontology, the study of fossils, from the study of the way that earthquake waves and seismic shock waves passed through the earth, um, <clears throat> came from studies of rocks in the laboratory, the kinds of pressures that they could stand within the earth, and so forth, the melting point of rocks very many areas. Um, <clears throat> and all these similar areas have now received some sort of feedback from the, uh, from the new theory and have got, in a sense, a shot in the arm, if you like. It's become much easier for paleontologists to explain the distribution of fossils in the past, assuming that the continents were mobile and sometimes collided, sometimes split apart. When they collided, then they brought their, their, uh, their now fossils, then living animals and plants together. When they split apart, then the animals and plants were separated on sort of floating islands, if you like. Um, <clears throat> the ice ages, for example, have also become somewhat more explicable when we understand how ocean currents probably changed as continents moved around on the globe. And one could go on through other areas of geology and point out uh, the ramifications of this new theory to every facet of geology, but that would take a long time and it isn't really necessary because we'll discover the importance of plate tectonics to all the aspects of geology as we go through the course. It's of fundamental importance to geology just as it's important, uh, the evolution is important to biology. And this is the reason we've introduced it very early in the, in the course. The rather fine film that you've just seen will have given you um, a much better picture in your mind than any book ever could do. Uh, the rather fine animation is better than we can certainly do, and you have a very, very good picture in your, your head already of just what's involved in plate tectonics. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of the next half hour is not to duplicate what you've seen, but to elaborate a little on the structure of the plates, the rigid plates that move around on the surface, to look at the um, means by which it's been suggested that they move around, and to look at some present-day plate junctions, to have a look at our present globe and just see where the margins of the plates are and how they are behaving. Um, <clears throat> the surface layers of the Earth are twofold. There is an upper rigid layer, we call this the lithosphere, and it's this layer from which the mosaic of plates is made. And then beneath that layer is a second layer we call the asthenosphere. Now the behavior of these two layers is very different, and it's this which is fundamental to, um, to plate tectonics. The upper layer is rocky and rigid. It's this that we walk around on, and this upper pink patch represents a continent. The purple on either side represents the oceans. This layer, the yellow layer beneath, represents the asthenosphere. And the character of the asthenosphere is plasticity, if you like. That, that word sums up how the asthenosphere behaves. We believe, in fact, that the asthenosphere consists of about 10% of liquid and about 90% of crystals. And so, is able to act as a kind of a lubricating layer over which the lithosphere can slide. The lithosphere underneath the continents is about 150 kilometers thick. It's difficult to be precise because the junction to the asthenosphere is not a sharp one. Beneath the oceans, it's perhaps 70 kilometers, uh, the, the thickness of the, the lithosphere. And the asthenosphere is probably a little bit thicker underneath the continents than under the oceans. In total, the asthenosphere is probably about 100 kilometers thick, maybe a little more here and a little less there. So we've got a 100 kilometer thick sort of plastic layer over which the, uh, the rocky plates, the solid, rigid, rocky plates can slide. Um, <clears throat> the character of the asthenosphere is not just such as to allow 
uh, the horizontal movements of plate tectonics, the horizontal movements of the rigid slabs on the surface, but is also very important in allowing vertical movements. And it's from this um, vertical movement that the asthenosphere allows that we can best judge its character. For example, if you imagine an ice cap being placed or growing, it's better said, on the top of the asthenosphere, then what happens is not really exactly what's happening in this plasticine model, but the asthenosphere flows out from the loaded area to the sides, to right and left beneath this model, and allows the ice cap to weigh down. Remember, the ice cap might be one or two miles thick. The present ice cap in Antarctica is at least a couple of miles thick. To weigh down on this mushy layer underneath, on the mushy asthenosphere, and that asthenosphere flows away. It comes up somewhere. Every time you press an area down with an ice cap, somewhere else uh, on the Earth must rise a little. And if you remove the ice cap, melt it away, then the asthenosphere will flow back into place and the continent will rise again. We call this glacial rebound, and it's probably familiar to many of you who've done geography. The present area of northern Ontario is still rising and has risen quite considerably since the ice cap that was here melted away about 12 or 15,000 years ago. This is a very rapid geological process. The speed of the rebound is something in the order of, oh, a centimeter, uh, two centimeters, perhaps a, a century, perhaps even faster than that in some areas at the beginning of the rebound. That compares with mountain building, which is perhaps, oh, a fiftieth of a, of a millimeter in a year. Very, very thin indeed. The thickness of a playing card is much thicker than the rate of mountain building per year. This process of rebound we call isostatic rebound as the asthenosphere flows back in under an area where there was once an ice cap loading the area down. So it's from that kind of, of reaction that we can, we can measure on the Earth's surface that we first had some hint of just what the asthenosphere was like, some hint of its plasticity. Once we discovered that, then it was just a short jump to suspect that probably the asthenosphere allowed horizontal movements as well as vertical movements, the horizontal movements of the rigid plates of lithosphere. Let's have a look at the structure of the lithosphere before we pursue uh, further the process of plate tectonics. The continental lithosphere, the continental rigid upper layer of the Earth, has a complex composition. The first 30, 40 kilometers or so, it varies from place to place. There's not a sharp and uh, always defined thickness. The first 30 or, four kilo 30 or 40 kilometers or so are formed of granite. You've already seen granite in the program on igneous rocks, and all of you have certainly at one time walked over some granite, and you've certainly seen it in the, uh, the front of banks and so forth. This is a, a chunk of granite, a pink one. The one in your rock kit is white, but granite, as you remember from the program on igneous rocks, varies according to the color of the feldspar. Sometimes it's pink, sometimes it's white. So that's what the upper 30 or 40 kilometers of the continental lithosphere look like, granitic in composition. The next layer, indicated here on green, always green, about 40 to, from about 40 kilometers down to 50, 55, thereabouts, is composed of gabbro. There is a piece of gabbro which you also ought to remember from your igneous rock kit quite a common rock. And that forms then the lower part of, or the, the, the middle layer, if you like, toward the, toward the bottom of the continental lithosphere. This boundary here, marked by the two shades of green, which I hope that those of you with black and white sets can still see, is an important boundary.